So my name is Christine Leonard. I'm the director of the DC office for the VR Institute of Justice. And as I see uh, a lot of familiar faces of congressional staff here in the room, I won't spend too long talking about um, the series that we've had because we're very excited to see so many of you coming back. But as you know, through the support of the MacArthur Foundation, uh, Vera has been very privileged to have put together this series around research and reform uh, in the youth justice system. And it's been really extraordinary that we've had this opportunity to bring in the top experts and practitioners from across the country on a wide range of topics. Um, as those of you that have been here with us in the previous sessions have heard, um, our goal is really to provide uh, the latest information from the field in terms of what has been happening in terms of both reform and research. And we are quite delighted um, to say that we now have uh, several of the earlier briefings up on our website. So if you weren't able to capture those, um, you can go back and, and, and catch the snippets there. Um, but also the literature that we've provided of those briefings is up on our website. And for that reason, I just want to acknowledge that we are also taping uh, today's session, but we'll, we'll conclude that before we have our, our discussion. Because as you can see, you know, what we've really tried to do is, and we appreciate all of your attendance here on the first day that the Senate has adjourned. So this is particularly uh, appreciated given that you could all be catching up on something else right now. Um, but to really have a, a really candid dialogue uh, and opportunity for you all to ask questions. So we haven't invited a lot of um, outside organizations. I'm, I'm delighted today that some of our, par our partners and supporters from the MacArthur Foundation are here with us, but this conversation is off the record. And uh, we are really delighted that um, we will have two more panels in January, one on reentry of youth uh, following contact with the justice system, as well as our final uh, briefing on uh, the intersection between the child welfare system and the juvenile justice system. And so those dates uh, are, are outside on the flyer that we have, if you can uh, note it on your calendar. Hopefully it'll work with the congressional calendar. Uh, and we won't have too many conflicts on those days. But in addition, um, I'm really excited to announce that on February 6th, we will have our final event, which will feature as a keynote speaker, Larry Steinberg, who is one of the most uh, renowned uh, researchers on adolescent brain development, uh, who actually just spoke this week and another uh, event here in Washington hosted by the MacArthur Foundation. And uh, he is just incredibly uh, persuasive and, and, and insightful about what he knows in terms of the brain science research, but also um, what I think a lot of us can remember as teenagers uh, in terms of how it can impact uh, youth behavior and decision making. And so it will be terrific to have him as, long, as well as some agency representatives and some others to talk about where we see um, some opportunities for um, action uh, in, the, in an increased federal role in the juvenile justice system in, in the year ahead, which we hope uh, can bring a lot of promise in terms of all of the bipartisan legislative initiatives that are out there, um, but also uh, a lot of the new members of Congress, as well as those that have been championing these issues in the past, who have expressed a strong interest uh, to move forward in the coming year on some of those activities. So with that, I wanted to turn today's program over um, to Dan Wilhelm, who is the Vice President and Chief Program Officer at Vera. He uh, will uh, introduce our panelists and um, facilitate today's discussion. And again, um, thank you all for joining us. And if you have any questions uh, after the panel or uh, at any point during the recess as you're catching up, please don't ever hesitate to reach out to us. So thanks. Turn over to Dan. Thank you, Christine. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Christine said, my name is Dan Wilhelm. I'm the Vice President and Chief Program Officer at the Vera Institute of Justice. For those of you who aren't familiar with Vera, we are a 53-year-old nonpartisan nonprofit organization based in New York City that partners with government through research, technical assistance, and the piloting of new projects to uh, come up with solutions that make the justice system safer and more effective and fairer. Um, We've been deeply involved in youth justice, juvenile justice work for many decades now, and um, in particular, I've been working on the issue of family engagement for, uh, for, uh, for about two decades in a variety of different ways. Um, 
As Christine said, this is the fifth in what is a nine-part uh, a nine-part series of events on critical issues in juvenile justice. Um, I'd like to also join my, my voice to Christine's and thank the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation for their generous support of this work, and in particular, Lori Garduque, who heads up MacArthur's justice work. Uh, she and her colleagues are here with us today. We very much appreciate them taking the time to, to join us. Um, and these sessions were set up um, for a number of reasons, but primarily because juvenile justice remains a very difficult and thorny issue, and it's, a very, and it's an issue about which many people don't know as much, frankly, as they probably should. Um, and so this, uh, we conceived of this series with MacArthur as an opportunity to really educate folks, policymakers, uh, members of Congress, and their staffs on the, the critical issues facing the juvenile justice sector today and as we go forward. Um, we are lucky today uh, to have some of the leading experts in the country on the topic of family engagement and youth justice joining us. Um, and it really gives us an, a, a real opportunity to delve into this, this, uh, this topic. Um, few propositions seem as self-evident as the one that suggests that families matter to young people. Uh, they matter to their development. They matter to their ability to make good choices, to make safe choices, to make healthy choices. And they matter in the ability to, 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 have, to help young people set out on a path that ultimately is responsible and productive and leads them to responsible and productive lives as adults. Yet, for many children who are invade, involved in the juvenile justice system, the system operates in a way that can often result in estrangement between children and their families. Um, indeed, many, many jurisdictions, many places, um, operationalize an assumption as part of their juvenile justice structures, that families are part of the problem, um, that, uh, that families are not a source of strength and families are not a, a, a reason for uh, helping children, but that in fact they should, be, they should be kept distant. And so in many places, at best, systems and structures do nothing to facilitate contact between kids and their loved ones. And at worst, these systems and, structure, and structures actively discourage and impede interaction between children and their families. So that's kind of a gloomy prognostication or a gloomy assessment of what's going on, but yet amid that gloom, there are some real signs of change. Uh, we're seeing in a number of jurisdictions, a number of states, a number of counties around the country, uh, a reassessment of the fundamental notion of the importance of families and the lives of kids, especially those kids who are justice system involved. Um, and a reassessment of the notion that, that families properly engaged and properly supported can play a catalytic and, and, and transformative role in helping to put kids on those paths to healthier, more productive lives, both as juveniles and eventually as adults. Um, as I said today, we're lucky to have three of the leading experts in the country on this topic of family engagement and children to join us uh, and who can help us unpack three important aspects of, of this topic. Um, to my left, we're gonna, we're gonna hear from Margaret DeZariga. Margaret is the director of the Family Justice Program at the Vera Institute of Justice. Uh, at Vera, she works to help kids, juvenile justice organizations, corrections departments, and other systems actors to adopt family-focused and strength-based approaches. And I should, I should note that family justice works both on the juvenile side and on the adult side of the, of the justice continuum. Uh, prior to coming to Vera, Margaret was the Director of Training and Technical Assistance for Family Justice when it was an independent organization. Family justice has an odd history in that it started first as a Vera project. It was spun off, but then a number of years ago, the National Technical Assistance and Training part of family justice came back to Vera, where it now operates as a, as a, as a program. Um, Margaret will be talking a bit about what family, just, uh, sorry, what family engagement means, uh, what the definition of family is, why it matters, and what the opportunities are for uh, reform in, in the states and in the counties around the country. To Margaret's left, we'll then hear from Wendy Luckenbill. Wendy is the Senior Recovery and Resilience Specialist for Children, Youth, and Families at the Community Care Behavioral Health Organization based in Pittsburgh, but active throughout Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey. Uh, Wendy works to enhance family and youth voice within community cares operations and programs. 
She has a distinguished history as the former, uh, as the former child policy coordinator for the Pennsylvania Mental Health Association. She's the former president of the National Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health Board of Directors. She's a nationally renowned uh, trainer, a technical assistance provider, and has been very active for, for a long time in the, the work that the MacArthur Foundation has supported through its Models for Change program. Next to Wendy is Ryan Ward. Ryan is the Senior Program Associate at the Center for Native American Youth at the Aspen Institute. Uh, and it, uh, Ryan grew up in Oregon and is an enrolled member of the Cowlitz Tribe of Indians in Washington State. Uh, in addition to being an attorney, Ryan oversees a variety of activities at the Center for Native American Youth, including steering a quarterly roundtable series uh, with federal agency partners in the White House on Native youth issues and, on, uh, and overseeing a public event series uh, on Native youth priorities and issues. Um, I should note that, going back to Wendy for a second, Wendy will be talking to us about her experiences in Pennsylvania, which is a state that has done a, a tremendous amount of work over the last decade on in, uh, incorporating family engagement into state and, and county structures. And Ryan will talk to us about a bit about the, the special challenges and opportunities present for uh, Native American youth when it comes to family engagement issues. So without further ado, uh, let me turn it over to uh, Margaret, but sorry, before I do that. Um, we'll hear from each of our panelists. They'll talk a little bit. I'll then engage them in a conversation. I, I'll have some, I have some questions I'd like to pose to them. And then we'll throw it open to all of you uh, and have plenty of opportunity for your questions from the floor. And if folks feel like they have questions or points that they'd rather raise uh, individually with any of the panelists, our, our panelists have graciously agreed to stick around. So please feel free to stick around yourselves, come up afterwards, and feel free to talk to any of us on the panel if you, if you like. So thank you again for taking time out of your very busy days and on a day where, where those of you on the Senate side could probably be catching up, as Christine said, on lots of other work. Um, but let me turn it over to Margaret. Thank you. And thank you all very much for being here. Um, so as Dan mentioned, you know, we know from research that youth do better uh, during a period of incarceration and once they come home when they have family support. This is totally intuitive. You know, we can all think about transitions in our lives uh, where families have lent us a couch to stay on, provided that job contact, um, let us borrow their car to get somewhere we needed to go. Uh, we've seen that youth do better uh, behavior-wise in facilities when they have good family engagement and they also are doing better in school and when they come back out into their communities uh, when they have those strong positive adult figures in their lives. We also are seeing that youth who are themselves parents um, in the juvenile justice system must have opportunities to maintain contact with their own children. Uh, it's not only helpful because of the motivating role that that can play for the for the young parent in the facility but also so critical for those children and, and their sense of family that they're developing. So when we're talking about family engagement, um, I, want you, I want to encourage you to think about that broadest definition of family. So we're thinking not only about um, those sort of blood relations, extended family, nuclear family, foster families, but also other people who youth see as being like their families. So it could be that auntie down the block or the coach from the neighborhood or a community elder um, either in a formal or informal way. At the Vera Institute of Justice, uh, we're working with state and local juvenile justice agencies to help them increase their levels of family engagement throughout their systems. Our work is informed by the voices of youth and families in the systems, as well as by agency staff who spend a lot of time working with the youth. And I want to share with you at least one example of how this plays out in one jurisdiction. Um, so in Ohio, we've been working uh, in the state level facilities there for, for many years, and staff in Ohio are using what we call the juvenile relational inquiry tool to identify who a youth would consider to be in that support system. So um, asking questions not only about, you know, who do you consider family, but also who can you really count on uh, when you need support, or who's always been there for you? Because oftentimes when youth are incarcerated, and this is true for adults as well, they start to assess, you know, who's actually come to visit or written letters and maintain relationships, which relationships have kind of fallen off, and which relationships do youth want to invest, on, invest in as they return back out into their communities. 
So engaging youth in conversations about those social supports um, is a really critical piece. So staff are, are doing that in the, in the Ohio facilities, learning more about who's in the youth social support network, and then inviting those family members into the treatment team meetings that happen on a monthly basis um, so that families are part of the discussions about the youth education plan, their treatment plan, and those sorts of things. Now, while the youth incarcerated, um, the juvenile parole officers are also working with the family at the same time, because the parole officers have to maintain contact with the family throughout the youth incarceration. So it's a real opportunity to kind of build relationships between the parole officer and the family. One really interesting and I think exciting use of technology that we're seeing in Ohio is that the parole officers are now showing up to do the home visits with a laptop, which doesn't sound revolutionary. Um, but the laptop actually has a webcam built in. And so when the parole officers show up, now families are excited to see them because they know that it means they could do a, a virtual video visit with their child in the facility. And I can only imagine what that might be like for a child in a facility to be able to see their parents you know, on the living room couch, perhaps with the family pet, or you know, those other sort of pieces of home that they'd be missing from afar. But importantly, this, this use of technology is also helping to improve the relationship between the parole officers and the families, and, and sort of paving, ways for, paving the way for other kinds of conversations. So the parole officers are using these home visits as an opportunity to share with families the kind of information youth are learning in the cognitive behavioral therapy programs that they're part of in the facility, so that families better understand what's happening in the facility, and then they can be reinforcing those same messages with their children either on the phone or when they're visiting, but also importantly when the children come back to the household. So, you know, the work in Ohio has been tremendous. Um, we, you know, we've spent a long time working there and know all the Ohio airports very well. Um, and working state by state is very gratifying in many ways, but we can't, uh, we, we're impatient for change, and so we want to try to affect more change more quickly. And so in order to do that, we partnered with the Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators and their Performance-Based Standards Learning Institute to develop a set of national family engagement standards for juvenile facilities. Um, many of you may be familiar with this set of acronyms, um, but uh, for those of you who aren't, in 1995, OJJDP supported the development of the performance-based standards to help increase uh, the quality of conditions in juvenile facilities. And those standards focused on a lot of important aspects of facility life, like health, education, reintegration. But we felt that it was critical that family engagement was held in that same regard. So we helped develop a set of family engagement standards that states across the country are now reporting on. And those standards help states complete a self-assessment, sort of identify how well they're doing on family engagement. The self-assessment requires the states to do confidential surveys of youth and families. And um, built into this, this mechanism is some concrete guidance for states to use on how they can improve their levels of family engagement. So it's not just a rating system without um, sort of help to get to the next step, but it's all sort of built in there. And Indiana, I think, is a great example of how, how to do this sort of self-assessment and then really affect some positive change. So Indiana completed the family engagement standards for their facilities. They weren't satisfied with what they found. And so they decided they were going to make some changes. They uh, created some family councils at their facilities to start engaging parents and families in shaping um, some of the local practices in each facility. But one thing that they changed, which may sound minor, is that they really revolutionized their vis visitation policy. So in many facilities, um, Visits are limited to the weekends. It may be that you know, children with last name A through M can visit during these hours and other children during these hours. And it's, it's a little confusing, um, and it really limits the amount of family contact youth can have. Indiana did away with that approach, and they said parents can now come into our facilities anytime they want as long as the children's not in school. Um, so you know, really just sort of shifting the whole nature of, of parent engagement. And one facility saw visits double as a result of this relatively simple change in policy. And we are now um, conducting a research study to learn more about the change in Indiana and what impact that's had for the youth in the facilities while they're there, but also when they go back out into the community. So we'll be looking forward to sharing those results probably in about a year.
but, um, but there's certainly some promising practice there in Indiana. So by sharing more about how jurisdictions can increase family engagement and really partner with families, we hope that many more states follow in the footsteps of Ohio and Indiana to, to ultimately support youth and families involved in the juvenile justice system. Um, and I look forward to more conversation as the afternoon goes on to learn more about your interests in this topic. Great, thank you, Margaret. Now let's turn to, to Wendy, who will talk a bit about her, the Pennsylvania experiment. And it was an experiment, um, which we didn't realize was going to be as hard as, as it actually was. And I want to thank everybody for coming to share this discussion and thinking about family engagement, because it's so important and, it, and it's so new. And I especially want to thank the MacArthur Foundation for supporting us through Models for Change, because when we started, there was nothing. There was no literature and there, there was no research on family engagement in juvenile justice. And it was their support that let us nudge, I believe, the whole field forward um, with the Pennsylvania work because we were the first ones to really start to talk about how to, how to actually make this happen. So I brought my monograph from 2009, which is a golden oldie at this point, but I think it's still very relevant. And in it, it discusses the early process. And we also have a guide that I'm going to refer to. And there's plenty out there if you want a copy. But you might ask, uh, why is Wendy Luckinville, who has a Bachelor of Fine Arts, doing policy on juvenile justice? And, and it's because, um, like many families, I found that services were siloed and inaccessible. And so in the uh, 80s and 90s, when I was trying to get help for my kids, I couldn't find any. And I found other families who were having the same problems. And we started helping each other. And um, there was some early work coming out of Jane Nitzer's report to Congress in the late 80s, which said that um, children were falling through the cracks and the, sur and the systems weren't working. And so in Pennsylvania, we launched CASP, which is a child and adolescent service system program. We're probably one of the few states that still uses that term. Most people now talk about system of care, and that sort of comes out of the mental health lens, and it's funded through SAMHSA. Um, but there's been a lot of work about family engagement and, and evidence-based practices and what really works. And we know across all the systems, child welfare and juvenile justice, but education, developmental disabilities, and certainly mental health, if we can keep kids with their families and give families the supports that they need and link them to natural supports, we're going to have better outcomes for children. Um, so we knew that and we believed that in Pennsylvania, but we didn't have any tools to use. Um, and we didn't have any guidance. And we had some language in our Juvenile Justice Act that said families were supposed to be involved. But what does that mean? So there's also a term called par paris parente, which is a Latin term. And it means um, the status parent. And that's how the juvenile court has operated for over 100 years. Um, if a child's in trouble, the state takes over the parenting of the child with the idea that they're going to rehabilitate the child and then return them to the community and maybe the family. And that doesn't always happen. Well, that's the lens that juvenile justice was functioning under in Pennsylvania. It was not the lens that the family leaders were functioning under um, who felt that the juvenile justice system wasn't welcoming their input and their participation. So we started some dialogue, which ended up in um, going out and doing focus groups. We did 17 focus groups. We interviewed over 200 people. And quite interestingly, whether it was a, a cadre of judges or juvenile probation officers or youth or family or psychologists, everybody had some, some very consistent themes. And they're embraced in, in my book, which I'm going to just briefly go through. And first, I want to point out to everybody that the one thing that we figured out was that there was not a system-wide adoption of effective evidence-based strategies and services that support the family role at the individual child and also at the policy and planning levels. So if there's one ask that I have for the federal government is that they support the development of research base so we can substantiate that having families involved isn't just a nice thing to do at the end of the day, but it's critical to maintaining kids in their communities and helping 
helping them move to be responsible adults, including those that are in conflict with the law and open to juvenile justice. We don't have a baseline. We don't know in Pennsylvania and we don't know nationally how many families are effectively and authentically involved in their child's juvenile justice rehabilitation. So we don't have any idea what the golden standard would be. Um, should 80% of the families of kids that are in conflict with the law be attending meetings or should it be 100? And so Margaret's work about standards is just so critical. We have to measure what we're doing so we know what's effective. One of the things that families told us was that um, they, were, they knocked on many wrong doors, which is the Jane Nitzer finding from 1989, that it's very hard to get help. Um, I had a commissioner in Berks County, I'm from Pennsylvania. He was very proud to announce at a meeting one time that he advised all parents that called him to leave money out on the kitchen table if their child was in trouble. Because then when the child took the money, they could call the police and then get them into the system. Well, that, that's not the loop that we want. But the public um, needs help in understanding, and that's where the federal government can really help us advance the kind of work that we're doing uh, to ensure that families have access to effective early prevention and intervention services. The next really big um, topic is sort of a heart and soul topic, and that's respect. Um, I, t I, call f I have a curriculum now that we use in Pennsylvania that we wrote, and one of the things that we teach is um, that we don't call families dysfunctional or resistant, but we ask people to call them families with multiple challenges, which really then describes families as, as having needs that we can possibly serve instead of dividing families right down the center of these are the families we can help and these are the families we can't help because they're too complicated, they're dysfunctional, they're resistant. Um, but juvenile justice professionals don't have the tools to help engage more families and so, I think, you know, in the need to do what they, they're trying to do, they help the families that are willing to come to the table and the families that they can't engage for whatever reason are just families that are not helped. So respect is really critical. One of the things that families say that they want are peers, just like the old Alcoholics Anonymous and every other peer-to-peer -peer support. We want to talk to somebody who has lived experience. And so in this particular situation, to be able to talk to a family who's trained to support another family in navigating a system and understanding all the conflicting emotions and shame that you have when your child is in conflict with the law and to help the family better partner with the juvenile justice system is a really effective practice that we have almost no research on. Just two more recommendations and the one, and it comes with a lot of concrete recommendations, but one is around local juvenile justice system policy and practice. So we're really tr changing the way that the court interacts with families. In Pennsylvania, we've instituted motivational interviewing, which is a lot more listening and a lot less talking to or for um, the family and the child. But there's an array of services that engage families, um, offering, making sure that uh, services are available, that partner with the families are really important. Um, we have a, a family involvement guide. This, this actually took three years to write. This was easy. The big picture stuff was easy. Explaining the juvenile justice system to a family and also to schools and, and other community people turned out to be really hard. We have 67 counties. We're a county-based system. Each juvenile probation jurisdiction explained the juvenile process a little bit differently. It took us two years to just get a flow chart down because everybody thought the flow was actually a little bit different. But we're very proud of this guide, not only because it explains the juvenile justice system to families, but because it emphasizes to the families and the practitioners that families are partners and there's many places along the way, many logical intersects where a family can have specific things that they can be doing and we give concrete examples. And we don't want this guide to just be in the waiting room. We want it to be in the hands of the probation officer and the hands of the family so while they're discussing whatever point in the process the child is at, there's this tangible information that they can look at while they're having the conversation.
but afterwards. Because everybody knows when you go to the doctor, or you're in any kind of meeting where you don't understand really what's going on and somebody's telling you terms and information that's not part of your you know, normal lingo, you go home and think, wow, oh, did he say I was supposed to take the medication with food, without food? That sense of being lost is the sense that families have in a very foreign system that's never been designed to include them. And finally, um, we're working at the state level with all our partners on um, changing law and policy. Um, so we've been able to, for instance, um, the federal funds that come down to every county are passed through our state advisory group, or in our case, it's the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. And that money is now linked to outcomes on a larger reform framework which we now have called the Juvenile Justice System Enhancement Strategy, but one of the key components of that strategy is family involvement. So if you want to receive your federal money, then you need to be able to demonstrate you're in line with the Juvenile Justice System Enhancement Strategy, which includes family involvement. And so therefore, the curriculum that we wrote for probation officers can be accessed through that funding and you can train your whole department of uh, professionals on the tools and, and, and practice that they can acquire in the curriculum. So I just want to mention one more thing, and that's that we develop principles. Um, and we had regional meetings, so we've shared these principles with a lot of folks. And I like to start right in the middle, because I don't ever have time to do all the principles and talk through them all in this kind of a presentation. But I always like to challenge people um, to think about this principle. It's that all families will act in the best interest of their child and fulfill their role when they have the knowledge, skills, and supports necessary to provide ongoing and developmentally appropriate guidance and interaction. And I will tell you that the probation field finds this to have some dissonance. It's not the experience that they have. But it's not asking probation officers to say that all families absolutely will participate in the most progressive and effective and nurturing style. It's asking probation officers to expect that all families have that capacity. And so the next principle is really the caveat where we say where families are unable to act in the best interests of their child, and that will happen. This should be seen as a complex phenomenon that the family would choose to counteract if an avenue to do so presented itself. And then the probation officers say, well, do you expect me to be a social worker? Do you expect me to fix a family? No, but we expect you to have compassion and understanding where you're able to link a family to a service, um, that you're able to offer that service to the family and see if you can support them to support their child. So it's a very inclusive uh, process. I was told by one of our um, prosecutors that I had rose-colored glasses on and must be some kind of li liberal because that just is too dissonant with what, what his experience is. And yet he emailed me the next day, and I'll tell you who he was later, Lori. But uh, he emailed me the next day and he said, you know, I took some time to think about your point, and I agree. Um, but it's a very different approach than the approach that um, we've been taking to this point. So I hope you take a time to read through the, the, the Red Book because it's really inspired the rest of the work that's come over the last six years or so. I think our guidebook is important because it doesn't encourage families to feel alienated from a system that's about to exploit them. To, to, but to encourage them to join with a system that can help real rehabilitate their child. And then I also do have information on Collaborative for Change, which comes out of the National Center for Mental Health and Juvenile Justice and is also supported by the MacArthur Foundation because I'm a faculty with them and we have specific focus areas. So um, the, the National C Center for Mental Health and Juvenile Justice and the Vera Institute are the only resources nationally that are out there trying to proclamate um, family engagement and develop some standards and technical assistance to try to grow the practice. So those are two resources for you. Thank you very much, Wendy. So Ryan, can you tell us a bit about the interaction between families and Native youth? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I just want to thank everyone <clears throat> for being here as well. Native American youth are a very uh, often overlooked population, very 
uh, invisible to uh, the mainstream society. And so this is a great opportunity for hi to highlight some of the challenges that they face and why that this, this particular issue, family engagement, is important and has a potential huge uh, uh, beneficial impact on Native youth. And so I wanted to kind of talk about sort of what it's like for Native youth today um, and, and share some statistics with you. Um, a lot of this will be uh, kind of doom and gloom, but I have positive stories, I assure you. I will tell you about those afterwards because I want to make a point during this. But come up to me and ask about some of the really positive things that are happening with uh, young people in Indian country. But I wanted just to highlight some things. There are uh, 566 federally recognized tribes in the United States right now, and there are 2.1 million Native American youth. And so of those youth, about 33% live in poverty. Uh, they, have, they graduate uh, high school at about 50, uh, about 50 percent graduate high school, which is dramatically lower than other populations. As uh, the graduation rates have increased for other populations, they've actually decreased for Native Americans over the last decade. Um, they have a shorter lifespan. They use cigarettes, uh, abuse uh, alcohol and drugs at a higher rate than the general population. Suicide uh, is the second leading cause of death. Uh, Native young people take their lives at 2.5 times the rate of the general population. Um, and in some communities, that's upwards of 10 times the, uh, the rate of the general population. Uh, they're overrepresented in foster care. They're overrepresented in um, the juvenile justice system uh, relative to their population size. They experience uh, post-traumatic stress, stress disorder at a rate uh, three times the general population. Um, and to put that into pers uh, perspective, they experience uh, PTSD at the rate of a combat veteran coming back from Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, there are a lot of reasons why that is so. Uh, that could take a whole nother panel talking about the uh, legacy of um, uh, failures of the federal government and others with regard to Native uh, populations. But for the purposes of talking about this issue today, really trying to highlight within our work at the Center for Native American Youth at the Aspen Institute, we go out and we talk to young people either in their reservation communities or in urban Indian communities. And one of the things that they highlight all the time is how big uh, family is to them. It's a huge uh, source of support and strength in Indian country. And that's something that they describe to us all the time. They, um, as, as Margaret uh, mentioned earlier, it doesn't, isn't defined in just the, a family isn't defined as the nuclear family with you know, two parents and a couple of brothers and sisters. This includes other extended family members, your aunts, your uncles, your grandparents. Speaking from personal experience, my grandmother had played a very large role in taking care of my cousins on Skokomish Reservation in Washington State. Um, and that's something, you know, those, that, that's someone who, in this situation, they would turn to, not their parents. Um, spiritual leaders in the community or other members of the community is what are, are typically what are considered family members. It's not confined to that really kind of sort of narrow uh, definition. Um, but why this is important and why these, the national standards are important are that Native American youth find themselves interacting with different um, uh, they, with the tribal systems, state systems, and federal systems. Uh, so with regard to the federal system, although there, there are no, there's no juvenile division in the federal court, there are no um, specialized juvenile court judges, there are no juvenile prob probation officers, Native American youth still find themselves in that system that is not equipped to deal with them. It does not have uh, cultural supports in place does not even have education uh, components. So these young people are literally just sitting there. Um, they're, I mean, they're, they're being det detained several hours away from their home communities and their families. So that, that uh, presents a huge um, burden for families to travel to even make uh, these visits, visits. And they don't have you know, the probation officers and such to actually interact with the family either. So there are some huge, huge challenges with regard to the federal level. There are over. Um, Roughly 70% of Native Americans live off of reservation, so they will then interact with the state system. And so the state system isn't equipped to deal with unique needs of uh, tribal members either, and don't consult with tribes uh, with regard to their practices. Um, and if they did, the tribes would tell them that this is an important issue, that engaging families, engaging tribes is very important. There are no legal requirements. They don't even have to ask young people who come through their system whether or not they're Native Americans. So these young people then become lost to the tribes. 
They are several hours away from their family. So they're feeling you know, very isolated. And I was talking about the uh, PTSD that they experienced, the trauma that they've experienced in their lives. They are now often re-traumatized as they go through this system um, with the lack of supports that are available, lack of uh, culture-informed, uh, sorry, culture-informed and trauma-informed um, staff of these facilities. And so that only compounds the problem. So they have these, these two systems that are in place that they interact with um, that aren't equipped to deal with them and don't engage their families. And uh, in, some in some cases, there have been positive efforts, which I can talk about a little bit later, um, some efforts between tribes and local governments, state governments, where they've tried to uh, better those relationships, involve families more, but there are still a lot of difficulties around that. Um, there are, like I said, there are no, there, tribes don't have to be notified, families don't have to be notified. So the, these young people are essentially operating in these systems alone. They are not, and I love the, the example of being able to uh, set up a laptop and have them interact with, uh, with the probation officer and the family, but a huge challenge in Indian country is lack of broadband access. So that's not even a, possible, a possibility. So if you know, we could do that, that would be really, really great and that could be amazing, but there are efforts to do that in a lot of these communities. There are people that are going out and interacting with these families. It's just something that, you know, talking about earlier how families are seen as the problem. And so these young people are now in these systems by themselves that they'll have no understanding of, you know, their needs. And with regard to tribal systems, the tribal systems that are in place are so severely underfunded that they can't, they don't have these mechanisms. They do have people that, um, from the tribe that work in these facilities that have these, the understanding of cultural norms and traditions and needs and things like that, but they still don't have the resources, the capacity to make these things happen. And so that's a huge difficulty. Despite their best efforts, they're, they're working up against this system where they just don't have the resources to do the things that they need. They want to engage with families, but they just don't have the, the staff and the folks that would be able to do that. And with more resources and with these models, with these national standards, um, that could really have a big impact in those tribal communities. Like I said, the number of young people who are interacting with the state system, national standards could really help better those outcomes for Native young people because they're, they're presenting them with those opportunities to engage with their, their, their family. And hopefully, um, you know, it, it, uh, with regard to some other efforts, increase those educational opportunities and those, uh, the cultural components in the uh, uh, rehabilitation of those young people. And so those are some of the kind of the bigger things that I wanted to touch on. Um, and just, you know, just the sheer number of young people that live off uh, the, uh, the reservation and interact with these other <laughs> systems, this is really important and has a, a big impact for them. Um, I talk really, really fast. Sometimes I feel like I'm gonna pass out. I talk so fast. <laughs> so uh, I hope I'm trying to cover a lot. This is a really complicated issue and I really appreciate you folks coming to learn about this and anything that if you have follow-up questions afterward uh, about any of our work and other issues that, I mean, I mentioned a lot of really just awful statistics that are absolutely true. And if you want to follow up on um, some of that information, we do have some materials outside. There are other informa there's other information that we have about working with tribes. Um, but some of these things, I mean, this is the reality of being a young person um, in Indian country facing these things. Um, and then, uh, you know, facing a lot of different challenges and then when they get the juvenile justice system, it just compounds all of those things. And so I think one of the things I, I, I wanted to, to end on is that this isn't something that the federal government should be doing because, you know, it's the right thing to do. This is a legal obligation. They have a, they have a trust responsibility to tribes and to tribal members to provide for their public safety, their education, their health, this falls un into that. And that's why this needs to be a priority for the federal government, for members of Congress. And I wanna just highlight that, that this isn't something, and this is, you know, um, uh, to be candid, our, our um, chairman and founder, a former senator from North Dakota, Byron Dorgan, talks very openly about the failures of the federal government with regard to tribal people. And this is just a prime example of that, but there are these positive efforts that are underway that could really remedy some of those solutions, or some of these problems with some real solutions, so. Thank you, Ryan. 
Um, so I've got some questions I want to put to the panelists, and while I'm asking mine, I, I would invite you all to think of ones that you'd like to, you'd like to, to pose in a few minutes. Um, but let me start with a question to Wendy. One of the things that um, you talked about was the success you've had in Pennsylvania in uh, tying funding to a county that you've got basically got the state to agree to tie funding, pass through federal funding to a county's willingness to abide by this by the approaches that you've developed. Uh, two questions. How did you do that? Um, what, who are the, you know, we're in Congress, so let's talk about politics and, and the ability of, of, of political actions and uh, appropriations or funding actions to, to drive change, systems change. So how did you do that? And who were the essential allies that allowed, you to, allowed that to occur? Well, we definitely have a strong coalition of allies that, that goes back very many years in Pennsylvania, even though we're a commonwealth, so we don't have a state juvenile justice system that can sort of mandate down practice. And of course, it's always hard to mandate any practice within a courtroom anyway. A judge is going to do what they think they want to do. But we have a cadre of allies that consists of our juvenile court judges commission, so that's the juvenile judges. We have the Pennsylvania Council of Chief Juvenile Probation Officers, so those are the folks that are responsible in every county to make probation work, to make the decisions about who goes into a detention facility, who's going to stay at home, how much risk they are to the community, and then they, of course, make recommendations to the judges. And then we also have within our governor's administration, under our Department of Human Services, we have a Bureau of Juvenile Justice who's primarily responsible for oversight of our, our high security uh, facilities, our, what we call our youth development centers and our youth forestry camps, which are often called the state schools. Um, so those, those three entities work very closely together and they've developed a very strong synergetic partnership um, that they see themselves as responsible for the progress that we have in Pennsylvania. They also partner with a group called the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency, but it's not a distinct entity that our, our commission, um, which is our state SAG or state advisory group, they actually have members that are on all those other groups as well as some community folks. And that commission works very closely with our legislature to uh, engender knowledge, make sure that the legislature is on board and understands the promising approaches, the practices, the policy needs, and so forth that is keeping Pennsylvania really at the forefront of juvenile justice. Um, uh, policy and program delivery. Um, and one of the things that we've been able to do is sustain, even in a very challenging budget situation, we've been able to sustain our funding by showing that we're providing effective services that divert kids out of juvenile justice, first of all. So we've made a good sell for that whole approach. But also when kids are involved with juvenile justice, that we're giving them effective services and they're getting out soon. So we've been able to close one of our state schools. Um, most of our detention centers are nearly empty or closed. Um, in my county, in Berks County, we started a couple years ago with 300 kids in placement a year, and now it's down to about 10. So that's a dramatic change without any risk to the community and businesses and all the things that made us in the 90s be afraid of super predators. So it's that collaboration of everybody working together, the folks that know what's going on. We have um, a Center for Effective Practices, an epicenter um, that's developing evidence-based approaches and supporting folks to be able to document the things in their community that they think are working, but have never had the money to show that they can. So they can draw down federal money to that. So it's a really nice partnership between everybody that's based on very hard work sharing information and making sure that people understand that my commissioner's idea of passing you know out sentences to kids that are stealing from their parents when it's when they're entrapped it isn't the effective approach thank you wendy um you know talking about the the county state dichotomy and the the, the challenges that come with overlapping jurisdiction um, raises, I think, some of the points, speaks to some of the points that Ryan also raised around, um, you know, you've got native populations that are under federal jurisdiction, there are tribal, there's tribal jurisdiction, state, states get in the act depending on where people live and where, the, where they encounter law enforcement. Um, 
seems to me that's an especially challenging circumstance that goes along with all the other challenges that, that you noted affect young people who are, who are Native American. Can you point to some promising signs or some examples of places that have uh, tried to thread these various jurisdictional needles in a, in a more productive or perhaps less, less passive way? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one example is from Oregon. Um, I mentioned uh, earlier in the day that uh, Native Americans, our Native youth make up 2% of the youth population in Oregon, but they make up 5% of those who are in juvenile detention programs in Oregon. Um, I think recognizing this, but also just uh, being proactive, the Grand Ronde tribe in Oregon, um, through a OJJDP um, TYP grant, partnered with OIA to really increase the collaboration between the two uh, entities, the tribal entity and the, the state entity, to improve outcomes uh, for Native youth. And so they were working hand in hand over, I think, a four-year grant to really um, increase uh, the level of engagement of families, to uh, create programs that are more culturally sensitive and appropriate for young people, um, and, and through diversion programs and things like that, where they're actually working together um, toward a, a better outcome for, or better outcomes for, for Native youth rather than working against one another. And so that's a really good example. Um, a recent example in Washington State, Tulalip uh, tribe working with the local uh, government uh, in Everett, Washington, to uh, engage in um, one of the things that um, they're focused on is in, to push the, uh, the Everett uh, local government to engage with families more and, so, and, and be more aware of the needs of the tribal youth rather than just to shuffle them through the system. And so that's something they have a, um, I think it's a community account accountability board with folks from both sides that are really collaborating on that effort to make sure that they can overcome some of those challenges and some of those barriers between them and they're seeing success in that. And I think that really, um, any time that the tribes can, uh, that are they're consulted meaningfully on, you know, either state programs or federal programs, they're able to give their input and um, to really uh, help guide some of these policies. It'll improve outcomes for Native youth, and a lot of that stuff, uh, a lot of that still translates through to other populations as well. And you know, as family is a really huge uh, aspect of of Native cultures. Uh, I mean, being able to be lead advocates on that and push that is really gonna benefit other populations as well. And so those two are, are, are some really good examples. There's examples in Alaska and Arizona of tribes that are um, with criminal ju jurisdiction that are engaging families early and you know, often throughout the process. Um, but I think that, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, problems with funding uh, make that difficult. So going after uh, some of the federal funds and. Um, and, and, and if we have, you know, uh, requirements within that funding that they do, uh, they incorporate these models or uh, they engage families in a formal way and consult tribes, I think that will be uh, to the benefit of Native youth, but also the relationships between those two entities. And does it make any difference in terms of opportunities for family engagement if you've got a young person who's uh, part, of a, part of a tribe living on a reservation versus in a more urban environment? Are, do, are there particular challenges or opportunities associated with one or the other? Well, I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, there are definitely some differences between the two. Um, I think that, uh, I think it might be easier in some instances for those that are living in urban uh, communities. They're, you know, easier access, it's less rural, or they're closer to those facilities and things like that. And there could be some uh, more interaction. I think it would probably just lessen things that the internet access is there to be able to do some of that. But in the rural communities, there presents some of those uh, kind of greater challenges, being able to do that engagement. It would take more effort um, and communication between um, the, the folks involved. But I mean, I think that, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to, um, uh, I would just say that there are more challenges in, in some of the rural areas. And I think that's uh, true for non-native populations too. So, Margaret, is that the case when, when states or counties come to you and those that are, have especially rural characteristics, is that a challenge that you have to help jurisdictions navigate, how to provide services or how to, how to meaningfully integrate families with their, with their, with their children in a, in a less urban uh, environment where services may be less plentiful on the ground? It is. Um, and so I'm pausing. Dan's throwing a new question my way. Um, so I think 
I think one of the main challenges that we're seeing is so many families are having to travel, you know, many, many hours to visit their children in the facilities. And so, you know, like Ryan's saying, it's a, sim it's a similar kind of challenge um, in those rural areas, uh, the distances that families travel. But even, you know, families who are based in urban areas, if they're traveling many hours to go visit their children in a facility, it could even be in another state. Um, those barriers are there as well. So I think that's why when we look to to some examples like, like in New York um, where there's really big efforts to keep children closer to home and reduce those distances, um, increase opportunities for connection and engagement. Um, I think that can only facilitate more family engagement because at least that proximity issue isn't there as much. And what else, Margaret, when a, when a jurisdiction comes to you and asks for help, what, what are they most often what are they most often seeking assistance to do or about? And, what, and how often do you find that what they want help with actually jibes with what you think they need, what you find is the most important thing they need help with? Well, one, of, one thing that we often get asked about is, um, is if we can give facilities some kind of tool to determine who the good family members are, um, because then the facilities can just work with those good family members. and. And I think for us, that's a real opportunity to provide some education and to sort of shift the conversation um, so that we're saying, you know, what's most important is that youth have a really broad social support. Um, and if people can maintain those connections during a period of incarceration to that broadest array of social support, then in your counseling sessions, in your, um, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy programs, and in your classrooms and all these other opportunities where staff should be having one-on-one -on -one interactions with youth, that's where they can talk about, you know, what are you, what are you getting from this relationship? Is that person really coming through for you in the way that you thought they would? What would you like to see change in this other relationship in your family? Um, so that rather than the facility kind of policing who youth can and can't maintain relationships with, I mean, there are some exceptions, you know, if they're protection, orders of protection, things like that. But you know, aside from those kinds of situations, um, letting youth maintain the broadest array of relationships and then using those as real opportunities to talk about um, who they want in their lives, uh, we think is really important. So our work often starts with some very concrete tools that staff can use in their engagement with youth and with families. And then the hope is that the facility can shift from you know, needing, a, needing a tool to help facilitate a conversation with the young person to staff really becoming comfortable with asking about family support, asking strength-based questions, and then that becomes part of the culture of the facility. Uh, we know that culture change does not take place overnight, and so giving staff those concrete tools can be a real stepping stone for them to realize, you know, they can do this, it's within their skill set, it's something, you know, the best juvenile correction officers do naturally anyway, um, and then it becomes part of part of the culture of the facility so that, you know, if a family has a special request, the, the facility's response is always going to be, yes, we'll figure out how to make that happen. I don't know. It's not quite in our policy, but we'll figure it out, as opposed to what is often the case now where, um, you know, thinking about the, the, the parent, the state as parent, um, now often there's a sense that the state really knows better. But if we can shift that and really build on the strengths of families, um, then I think we can see some of that family engagement practice happening sort of more organically. Thank you. Let's, getting back to money just for a second, um, because we all know money matters. Um, you know, Wendy, you, we talked earlier about Pennsylvania's successful use of, of funding as a way to motivate counties to do, to do the right thing. Um, is that, it may be necessary, but is that sufficient to the challenge? And by, by that I mean, is that, have you determined that that's the best way to try to uh, influence county behavior, or do you want to see more? And by more, I mean greater statutory changes, greater regulatory changes, uh, greater changes to practice or policy that are mandated and, and are, not, uh, are not elective. One of the things that we had an opportunity to develop under the MacArthur um, Models for Change Action Network was a curriculum. And so there weren't any curriculums out there to train juvenile justice practitioners on um, effective family engagement strategies. Certainly the, the group of family advocates that were participating in 
this process, had some pretty strong ideas about what works and what doesn't work. We received training from different groups and SAMHSA's system of care and so forth. So we had some ideas. Um, but there was a real discussion about do we want to change people's hearts and minds or do we want to give them tools? And we decided, well, in a day and a half, we're going to try a shot at both. Um, but it's, it's very interesting to look at the attitudes that people come into the training with and the attitudes that they leave with. So just in a day and a half, and of course, is it going to stick? You know, can we make this an ongoing instructional process? Can we change practices and tie it to money and all that stuff? But can we just get some attitude shift? Um, and so one of the questions that we ask, I thought, was a fairly easy one. Do you, something like, do you think the family role is important in the juvenile court process? So in coming to court, going before the judge. Because in Pennsylvania, families have no right to speak to the judge, and they have no right to any representation. So they're purely there at the, at the beneficence of the judge. Um, so we asked that question, and the probation officers that we trained on um, in the pre-assessment, about I think it was about 40% said that it was important that families were part of that process, which is just astonishing. Here you're raising a child, and all of a sudden a court process comes in to take over and fix things. And in just a day and a half, we were able to shift that to, I think, about 70%. But there was a huge bump in getting folks to just think about what they're thinking because they're not thinking about it. They're shooting from the hip, they're going forward, they come right out of college, they go into probation, they learn from whoever their supervisor is and they learn from the conflicts that they're having with families and which ones to avoid. And by the way, I think there's a fair amount of vicarious trauma in all human service work, but particularly juvenile justice, where you're seeing kids sitting in institutions crying because their parents won't ever come see them and they don't have anybody and they want to give up. So, you know, there's a fair amount of alienation. So unpacking the process, figuring out what works with families, how to put that in place, making sure practitioners know how to do it um, is just as important as tying the money because it can, you can, you, can, you can play to a grant. You know, you can make things look like you're doing what you're supposed to. One of the things that we're doing now is we've developed a standardized satisfaction survey for families. So we think maybe we can get a baseline as to how well different jurisdictions are doing, and then we can look at what practices do they have in place, what policies do they have in place, why are families feeling much more involved in one jurisdiction than another. But much like Margaret's questions, they ask, you know, were, did, you, were, did you have input into the process? Did you feel welcome? Did you get the guide? Did somebody help you understand the process? Did you know where to go for help? You know, so we're asking about eight questions. We're going to ask them across all the different jurisdictions and start to get that picture because we've got to know if this is really going to work. I want to know after doing this for over 20 years, does family advocacy really work? Does family involvement really work? Or is it just a nice idea that we say we want to adhere to and maybe we should just get out of the way? But if it does work, then we need to support it and we need to fund the research to sustain it. Does that answer the question? It does. Um, so my, my last question, which I'll pose to each of you, and I, I'd appreciate it if you'd give me a, 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 a succinct response so we can, we can open it up to the floor. Uh, and some of you have touched on this already in passing, but what's the one thing, what's the mo one most important thing that you think the federal government can do to encourage, to encourage greater family engagement with juvenile justice populations? Ryan, we'll start with you. Well, I think uh, as um, we think about how Native youth interact with the state system, requiring uh, states uh, who receive federal funding to, um, they should require them to, I think, one, engage with tribes, but also adopt these types of standards to engage uh, families more. And so that I think is a pretty straightforward, simple thing. I mean, not that simple, um, but uh, I think that could be a, a really good start and um, would really kind of force uh, states to uh, work with tribes more collaborative, collaboratively, but also uh, engage with their families. Great, thank you. Wendy, what's the one thing that you think the feds can do well, to Well, I think what Ryan is saying is absolutely correct. If you tie money actually just to evidence-based practice, 
it's going to roll out to include family involvement because that's just the core of the newest practices that are coming out. But specifically, you know, we have technical assistance centers that are proclamating good practice, evidence-based practice, and if we don't insist that juvenile justice has technical assistance centers that are able to give that money and give that time and research to discovering what's really going to help families and kids, then we're wasting our time. There's no reason to spend federal money unless it works. So be, having that oversight of budgets and, and grants is, is really critical and the commitment to research that the federal government has in other areas needs to come now to family involvement in juvenile justice. Thank you, Wendy. And Margaret? Well, I just want to uh, quickly just touch on two, two thoughts. One is that you know, we know that parents must be involved in their youth education. And you know, there are certain funding streams to support that kind of work. And so where, where that, so, so, so places can use that in interesting ways. For example, in Texas, they're, um, they're providing a bus, the, the juvenile facility provides a bus to bring parents to the juvenile facility to participate in parent-teacher conference. This is big. So, you know, the parents are on site, they can meet with staff, they can have other kinds of conversations, they can visit with their child. Um, so thinking about those kinds of streams that exist now and using them in more creative ways, I think, is one thing that we could certainly see more of. The other group that we haven't touched on as much uh, this afternoon are youth who are involved in both the child welfare and juvenile justice system. And for those youth, um, I think opportunities to identify uh, other family members um, who maybe the youth may not even know but you know, using family finding technology and family group conferencing and some of those other things, I'm just borrowing one of Wendy's comments from earlier today, um, because I think it's really critical. And if we can help those, if we can help identify family members for those youth, it may not mean that they go home to those family members, but it may mean that they have you know lifetime permanent relationships with that family um, that help you know increase their social support as well. So I think both you know, building on those sort of existing streams uh, around the educational sphere, then also thinking about um, the youth in the child welfare system and better identifying family for them are two big priorities in my mind. 